Welcome back to the Gentleman's Gazette. In today's video, we discuss the $100 shoe versus the $500 shoe and everything in between. Just like with suits, there's a huge difference between an inexpensive and a more expensive shoe. Unfortunately, price isn't always a good indicator of quality. I'm not just talking about Gucci here and other designers, which automatically charge more because they have a name, but even lower end brands or less known brands oftentimes have hugely different prices for the same quality of shoe. In this video, I want to show you how to identify what's quality and what isn't, so you get the best value for your money. So if I show you those two shoes, which one is the $100 shoe? Actually, both of them are. So even among the inexpensive shoes, there are differences. Sometimes people simply don't wear dress shoe very often, and so they don't want to invest a huge amount of money. Other people have the money, but they don't want to spend it. Or they simply don't know the difference, and they look at them, and they think they're all the same. On the other hand, why would you buy a $500 shoe? A lot of people buy it for comfort. It may take a little longer to break it in, but they're usually made of all leather, which means you sweat less, and they have a cork insole, which is soft and cushiony, so even if you walk all day, it's still comfortable. Another reason could be that you want a shoes that lasts for years, that develops a patina over time, and then can be resold. With a $500 shoe, you typically also get a more classic and timeless last that will stand the test of time, and it's overly more elegant and stylish. Some people also want a higher-end construction method, such as a Goodyear welt or a Norvegese welt. In Austria and Hungary, you even have wood-packed shoes. That's also a quality, traditional method to do shoes. In the $200 to $400 section, you find the Blake construction and the Blake Rabbit. These are also sewn, but less expensive than Goodyear welted. The advantage of Blake construction is that you get a thinner sole that is softer. Because Blake offers a thinner sole, they're often used for summer shoes or loafers. However, the disadvantage is that when you're outside and it's wet and it rains a lot, your feet may get wet. Also, the lack of cork in a Blake construction shoe makes it less comfortable when you stand a lot or walk a lot. So now let's talk about the features of a $100 shoe. As you can see in the construction here, they have something that looks like a stitch, but more often than not, it's simply glued and it's there merely decorative to make it look like a more expensive shoe, but it's all glued. Even though there are glues in the market today that keep houses together, what they usually use for shoes is less expensive, cheaper, and doesn't glue as well. Therefore, soles will likely come off after a year or two of hardware, and then you can glue them back on but most of the time, the shoe overall is in such bad condition that you just toss it and buy a new pair. Sometimes you can see a welt at the bottom, but don't be fooled. That's probably just a Blake stitch or a Blake rapid stitch. And you can even see here, this looks like leather at first sight, but in fact, it's just a composite material that is supposed to look like leather, but it's cheaper and it's actually rubber. Something that you find a lot in $100 shoes is that they try to fake higher-end details, but usually the execution is not quite as refined. For example, on this shoe here, you have a stitch pattern at the bottom, and you can see a stitch pattern at the top. However, at the top, it's just injection molded. So it's not a real stitch, and it's simply meant to be deceitful. To truly understand the difference between Blake Rapid, glued, and Goodyear welted, please check out our in-depth guide here. Another hallmark of a $100 shoe is the inferior leather quality. Usually it's harder, and in order to sell the shoe for $100 retail, you can't use the best quality. That's simply not possible. Instead, you have to use second or third grade leather that is then sanded and pigmented with dye to cover up all the flaws. Even though it may not look very different than high quality leather, when you have a new shoe, once you walk in it, you create creases and the pigmented leather will just age very poorly because the pigments will come off and expose what's underneath. Also, the leather won't develop a nice patina. It just looks cheap and worse the more you wear it. Apart from that, a 
$100 shoes often don't have very refined lasts. Instead, they can be a little chunky, have kind of a, a boxy toe, and they're overall wide, so they fit every kind of foot. Another hallmark of a $100 shoe is the interior. Usually, the leathers are so stiff and hard that manufacturers put all kinds of foam on the inside. So when you put on the shoe, it feels quite soft, cushy, and comfortable, but that's cheap foam that will wear out very quickly, and then you just have hard, uncomfortable leather left. You'll hardly ever find a real leather sole with a $100 shoe. Instead, you have either a composite material that's made to look like leather, or you have a rubber sole. Apart from that, you usually don't have much color choice, and you get black, brown, or tan, but you probably won't find a nice burgundy shoe. Basically, a $100 shoe is only made to be worn for a year, maybe two, and then be thrown away. Now let's talk about the features of a $500 shoe. First of all, the leather is of much higher quality. It is aniline dyed, which means it's dyed all the way through. It has open pores that are often uncorrected, and you simply get a beautiful leather that develops a patina over time, which is exactly what you want, because it looks classic and elegant. Sometimes you also get a hand burnished finish from the factory, and you see there's a little gradient that gets darker towards the toe. In terms of construction, $500 shoes are almost exclusively Goodyear welted. That means you have a welt here on the outside and another welt that connects it in combination with a cork insole that makes it much more comfortable to wear. For example, this old Brook shoe here has been in my collection since 2003. I've resold it two times, it has been to five continents, and it's still going strong. Something that you don't really see in a shoe, but that is important, are the heel caps and the toe caps. On a quality shoe, they're usually made of a thermoplastic or leather. On a very inexpensive shoe, they're usually plastic. Generally, the last on $500 shoes are just more elegant and refined and timeless, and you also get a much better finishing in the details. The brewings are nicer, and everything is more thought through. Of course, you also get a much larger color range, including blues, tans, greens, reds, orange, and anything else you can think of. If you're just starting out and you're not sure what dress shoes to buy, please check out this video here. Now, in terms of brands, it can be really difficult. For example, if you take a J. Butler loafer, it's a Blake construction, it's a nice leather, it's made in Mexico, and it's about a $200 shoe. In my opinion, it's great value for the money. On the other hand, if you look at Paul Evans, they have the same blade construction. Shoes are made in Italy. The patina is very nice. However, the lasts are quite unrefined and they charge $400 for their shoe. For $250, it would be a fair deal. For $400, they're totally overpriced. Especially if you compare them to a shoe like Cobbler Union, which costs the same, is Goodyear welted, has an actual channel stitch at the bottom, has quality leather, has good leather interior that's quilted and doesn't rub off in terms of color. And overall, you wouldn't know that these shoes are so different if you just looked at the price tag. If you want good year old shoes in a $200 to $400 price range, you probably should go with something like Shoe Passion or Allen Admins. Of course, Allen Admins has a very specific style, so, if you like a more traditional style, Ellen Edmonds is definitely the way to go. If you want to go higher than that with finer details, there are lots of brands out there. And for example, you get a fiddleback waist and simply more refined overall look. Whether it's worth $1,000 or more is up to you and it'll be subject to an entire another video. If you want to learn more about recommended shoe brands, I suggest you go to our shoe guides where we sort them for styles, Oxford, Derby, and Boots. Even if you have the nicest suit, a beautiful tie, a good shirt, and nice cufflinks, cheap shoes will always bring your overall outfit down. If you want to buy a shoe and you don't think you can justify the high upfront cost, it makes sense to look at the cost per wear. Let's say you have a $100 shoe and you can wear it 200 times. That makes it 50 cents per wear. On the other hand, the shoe I bought in 2003, which had a retail price of $500, has probably been used for over 2,000 times. That brings the cost down to just 25 cents a wear, which is half of the $100 shoe. Not only does it cost half as much, but I also didn't have to spend time on replacing my shoe. I had a nice shoe throughout the years that looked elegant and upgraded my outfit rather than downgraded. 
You also just have to break it in once and you can even play with a patina and a polish. If it's a lighter color and you want to make it darker, that's no problem because it's an open pore leather. So overall, I can't give you a price range. It's just important that you educate yourself, that you know what's the leather like. Is it aniline? Is it pigment dyed? What's the sole like? What's the construction like? And what am I paying for here? To learn more about shoes, please check out our extensive guides on our website here. And you can also find a more in-depth guide about this topic here.